Uh, Bill Anderson, we're coming live from the Costa del Sol. I am absolutely delighted to in introduce my guest today, John Clark. Welcome, John. Hello, Bill. Can you hear me? I can hear you just great, John. Thank you. Now, John, you, you are a very well-known figure down in these parts, but bearing in mind that we're going out um, across the world, I think we should at least let people know who you are. And uh, while well, we're going to be talking about your book, My Search for Madeline, that, that, that's, <coughs> that's, the, that's the hook to let people uh, hang on to for the moment. Tell us a little bit about yourself, John. How did you end up in Spain and when did you end up in Spain? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Bill. And I imagine that probably the vast majority of the Costa Souls never heard of me. And, <laughs> and why should they really? I, I'm a, just a journalist uh, by, sitting behind the scenes, uh, a, a kind of local hack, really, that uh, believes in proper journalism. And I try not to become the celebrity at all and try and stay behind the, the camera and stay behind the scenes. So. Yeah. But um, yeah, some people will have known me as being the um, the editor and the owner of the Olive Press newspaper, which I've uh, well, it's been going now nearly sixteen years. So uh, it's, it's, I guess it's had a fair old innings, as they might say in cricket. Yeah, I mean the the, the Olive Press is is certainly very well known. Um, but you know, you, you as you say, you're very much in in the background of it all. I mean, you you run around everywhere, John. I mean, <laughs> it's like I'm in Mallorca today. I'm in Costa Blanca tomorrow. I'm you know, you're all over the place. But your background is very much in journalism, isn't it? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, now I, as I own the group, I have, and we've now got six newspapers. Unfortunately, I do have to travel a bit, and I, yeah. I have to put my publisher's hat on occasionally, which means uh, joining my my sales team. Uh, wherever that may be, whether, as you say, it's in Mallorca, which might be three, four times a year, and as uh, Costa Blanca, which is probably at least once a month. Right. Um, but, um, you know, I try as best as possible to be more at the sharp end with the editing of the newspaper. And I enjoy right. writing news stories. So you mentioned the fires. So over the last week, we, you know, last weekend, I think, Saturday and Sunday, I was up. Uh, filming and watching and talking to firemen who were fighting the blaze right. uh, you know on my weekend because obviously that was a huge international news story and I wanted to be there mm. to give our readers the best possible coverage and to understand as best as possible what was happening and I guess you could say I'm hooked to my job I'm probably a bit of a news junkie yeah. and I really really want to get the best coverage for anything that's in our patches and you know our patches Andalusia, but increasingly it's grown into the whole of Spain now because we've sort of with the internet we, we have visitors we have readers all around Spain and we now have a digital editor Fiona based in Madrid right. who's doing a fabulous job for us and, and and you know we have regularly now people calling in from Galicia or, or Asturias or you know even the Canaries with stories so you know I, I like to cover the big stories and and so I try I try when when I can build to to, to get out and do it, you know. And, yeah. I mean, the Maddie case is a good example of that. Yeah, well, we're going to come on to that in just a moment, John. But I, I think, you know, what you're saying here ties in very much with um, the, the, the case of Madeleine McCann. And we're going to talk about how you first got involved in that. But, you know, you're saying you're out there seeing the fires, seeing what's happening, talking to the firemen. That's That's very different, isn't it, from people just sitting on the Internet looking at pictures? Yeah, you know something, Bill, it's quite actually quite fascinating culturally, the difference between how we would report in England. And this is not to say there's not some brilliant journalists in Spain, but for example, I went out on this on the Friday, I drove up into the Sierra Bermeja and I went through, I don't know, let's say, I think probably actually three police roadblocks to go up and I showed right. my press pass every step of the way. And they were like, why are you coming up here? I said, well, because... I want to see with my own eyes what's happening. I want to try and chat to the to the local fire crews. I want to see what's happening, and, and and I want to get close up to get a feel for this. And what was interesting was able to sit, to park up by a technician from Infoca, who's was basically a spotter. He was one of the kind of senior technicians who was understanding how this weird cumulonimbus, you know, fire cloud was developing. And he said it's a new thing they just they've never really seen before. And he was explaining how it worked to me and how dangerous they were in terms of where the winds were and right. he then we started talking about how it started and he was able to explain to me exactly how it started and, and how three different fires were laid two of which took off and 
equidistance either side of the peak of the Sierra Bermeja. Yeah. And, you know, it was brilliant to be able to understand, you know, who did this and why they did it. And I mean, we don't actually know why they did it yet, but I had a pretty good steer as to who it was. It was apparently a balding guy probably looked a bit like you bill it wasn't me and, honestly uh, he, 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 he apparently got out the car at 9 30 at night uh just it was getting dark when the the poniente wind had just come up yeah. uh, and he knew that it was going to take and it was going to be at night so that you couldn't get helicopters and planes up there that evening so by the time the morning came round, it was already really well established uh, sure. i mean it's a horrifically cynical crime yeah. And I hope very seriously punished because I, I, we were debating a lot about whether this is murder or manslaughter because, you know, you must know when you set a fire like that that you are going to get hundreds of firemen going out and you must know that the danger for them is huge. Yeah. So it's a fine line, isn't it, between manslaughter and murder there? It is. And uh, we, we had a lot of problems three or four years ago in Mijas with people setting fires. Um, it wasn't always the same person, but um, mostly the fires that we had, we were actually evacuated twice from the house. Um, so, really? yeah, because we're, we're in the countryside and it was getting very close, too close for comfort. And uh, on two occasions we, we had to be evacuated and it is scary. The speed that was that, these... the, was that the Velta Cardo fire? That wasn't the 2012 fire, the big one that came in from Marbella. Uh, right we no, the, 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 these were more local. We had one that came down from La Cala Golf towards us, and the the other one was started actually just outside La Cala and and, and headed over this way as well. But anyway, the the. It, it, it's a very scary situation and, and I think pictures of it don't do justice to what it actually feels like. Um, well, I mean, you, you know, we were very fortunate that Hector, my, my office manager, had a friend who was actually fighting the fires. So right from the beginning, he very kindly sent us some videos right. from the kind of what I would describe as the heart of darkness. It was horrific. Yeah. You know, right in there, what, you know, where, as you know, one of these poor firefighters got engulfed and you got that sense of the danger they put themselves through up sure. there in the mountains at night when thing, things can change so quickly. Uh, um, sorry, can you hear? I'm back uh, yeah, now. yeah you're back again, that. John. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Sorry about that. No, I was going to say, but interestingly, I remember the 2012 fire. I, I turned up at Mikas uh, Town Hall and I wanted to try and have a chat to, uh, to at the time, at your, your mayor, Ankel Nozel. And I was very kindly. Uh, summoned up to his office and he, at the time he explained how the front was coming down from Cohen and another front had been coming up from Marbella and, right. and, and they were plotting. It was really interesting to see how carefully he had to plot the map and how to move resources and, and you know it's a military operation and it sure. has to be handled so carefully sure. and so well in order to put these things out. Mm -hmm. Okay John, you've just published a book. Is this your first book? It's not Bill actually, it's my okay. third book. Ah, it's um, okay. Third in a series of, of ten. Right. <laughs> I don't know, actually, no idea. I've only got, I, I, I've got through two novels in a series of three. The third one's been sitting half finished for about four years. But anyway, your book um, has just become available on Amazon and, and presumably some uh, through, through some other booksellers as well. My Search for Madeline. And this really takes us back to what, May 2007, John? Um, when that, Madeline that, McCann... That's right, yeah. So um, uh, actually, when that happened, I'd already written my first book, which was a book very close to, to home. Most expats around Mikas and Fuengarola remember the case of Tony King and the Costa Cup. Oh, yes. Um, Rocio Wanninghoff and Sonia Caravantes. And so I'd, I'd actually not been long living in Spain when that happened. So I actually did a lot of digging into that for a year and um, published a book then which I, I still think I'm very proud of that book and uh, there were some issues with it uh, unfortunately <laughs> but um, as I often are but most of the information in there I think was, was very interesting very you know and I involved close contact with his family and friends mm -hmm. and I think it's the only way to write a book is you know particularly in, in a crime book is to actually get right to the source and, and, and talk to as many people on the ground as you possibly can so again with Maddie McCann when it happened in 2007 in May I, I, I you know at the time uh, the Olive Press was very young it was only uh, six months old at that time right and um, you know it was a fledgling newspaper then and it, mm. you know it just been 
going since 2006 and and so I, I was still doing quite a lot of work for the national newspapers in England so you know I probably at least once a week would get a call from the Telegraph or the Mail or the Sun or the Star could you look into this or that so right. you know it, it could be anything uh, it could be you know a murder it could be a, a celebrity it could be a child falling out balcony window it could, you know it could be one of many many stories a fire story for example but on this occasion i got a call crack a door and ridiculously early and you know i often get a call at 8 eight thirty nine. this was you know seven o'clock or six thirty, something ridiculously early time when um i woke up and someone was like you know what the hell and i said look can you just can you just get in the car and get to portugal and i'm like well, what why you know can you get to the algarve it was the daily mail actually the foreign desk at the daily mail and uh right. I was like, yes, of course. And, you know, I was used to just getting in the car and going. Of course, you know, it was once you started, you know, working and you're crossing borders and you're driving around, you need good expenses and then you enjoyed the uh, the work. I, I You know, I, I asked why and they said I was a girl gone missing, a little girl. And um, she's gone missing in a place called Pradaluge, which I'd never heard of. I mean, I heard of, um, you know, um, Lagos and you know Faro and right. but Pradeluge, never heard of it, never heard of it, and uh, it turned out to be right the other end of the uh, the Algarve toward towards the tip and uh, Sagres, you know, where the bit great surf waves are. Right. And um, so I got in the car, I drove, I drove like stink. I, I, back in the day, I had one of those Subaru Impreza, and uh, <laughs> so it came over from England with me. <laughs> Ridiculous, I was a bit of a boy racer then, even though I had a young child who was right. about one year oh. old. I was still clinging on to my my youth in this ridiculous yeah. car. So I got there very fast, arrived, and um, I assumed she would have been found. I just thought she's she's got to be. She's bound to have just stumbled around, and she'll either turn up alive or dead. You know, she'll be you know in the sure. bottom of a pool somewhere or in a ditch. Or and the last thing I ever thought was that she was going to have been snatched or or killed. You know, you just imagine it's an accident. Right. So when when we I got there and there was there was no sign at all of her and people were already mo mobilizing to get out and put posters out and they'd been up through the night looking for all the local expats and quite a lot of local portuguese mm -hmm. of course the family and their friends as well and so uh, you know my my as you do in journalism bill the first thing you do you know is the five w's as they call it you know when why where who and uh, and and how with a w at the end with a w at the and, end yeah uh, you know, <laughs> you just you just get into automatic modes of just going through the paces so the first thing i found the apartment straight up the apartment go and walked up the steps and asked uh, you know could i speak to the parents and, and mm -hmm. they happened to be they were heading off actually relatively quickly off to be uh, to the police station to file an official report but they mm -hmm. were friendly and, and you know they were obviously very stressed out and they they just told me the name and you know i said who i was from the mail and i'd do my best to help you know and they were like thanks and that was that so i didn't i can't say i interviewed them really but you know I, I i wanted you know to sort of just try and monitor and gather as much information on locally as you possibly could in those early hours because yeah. they, you know they call it the golden hours don't they and i just wanted to be able to you know pick up as much information on the ground so it was a fact-finding exercise right. and you know i was there first because the press from the uk none of the none of the national newspapers could get journalists down there until mid-afternoon or late afternoon and so you know i was kind of holding hands holding their hands you know right the right. way through the day making sure that i did all the, the basic checks uh all the you know all the main talking to the manager of the ocean club you know trying to, to you monitor the local police what could they tell us which was actually nothing, nothing they right. wouldn't tell us anything at all which was very strange first of all um and you know obviously trying to talk to their friends really harder to talk to actually i must admit it was harder to talk to the, the so-called tapper seven but um i walked around the urbanizations looking for clues and uh, by some mid-afternoon the first of the national newspaper journalists turned up by then i was actually working for the mirror and the sun funny enough so i had to be brief three three um journalists about you know what was going on and they right. all had their own sort of ideas and angles on what they wanted to do so it's rather stressful having three bosses really for the first couple of days yeah <laughs> um but yeah so it was it was strange very strange. It, it, yeah and I, I i find it quite sad that you know um this has happened and, and actually nobody knew what was going to be the the aftermath of all of this at that point 
And, you know, a lot of people, all they could do was think about criticising the parents. You know, they shouldn't have left her, they shouldn't have done this, they should have done that, they shouldn't... And, and actually, the, the, the issue was about the little girl at that point and not about the parents, wasn't it? I, I agree. I think that, that came out a little bit later. But, yeah, I agree. It was Within a few weeks, people were criticising them. And, of course, you know, I'll, I held my hands up straight away. And, you know, we did the same thing. I remember a holiday in Mallorca only a couple of months earlier when my daughter was tiny. And we put her to bed in a hotel. And we actually walked in a place called Alcudia. We walked down the road yeah. about 100 metres of the listening device. Right. You know, from the making sure it worked every step of the way. You know, like in the olden days, that's how everyone did it. Yeah. You know, and you tap to make sure. You know, and it's, it's kind of like pre and post Maddie. You know how parents reacted because after Maddie went missing, everyone just suddenly, oh, you can't possibly do that. But of course, everyone did that at the time. You know, and sure. you can't blame the parents when you think when you've been a good look round Bill and you've seen the lay of the land and you've seen how few, how short the distances between the restaurant they were in and their apartments and you know, how how there was such a big group of them. And of course, this was a Mark Warner resort. So of course, they expected there to be security and proper gates and right. they expected there to be guards around. And, you know, they, they were also going every, theoretically, every half an hour to check on, on everyone's kids. And as you know, sure. you know, the, all the best wishes in the world, you know, best intentions. Yeah. It, sometimes, you know, it doesn't work. So, you know, there was... I think one of them went up there and didn't properly look. He went into the room and there was a weird feeling that there might have been someone in the room. Wasn't sure. Mm. He then went out without really checking. And then, of course, Maddie's mum, Kate, went in, I think, 15 minutes after she was meant to. So there was a then of a sort of 45, more, potentially an hour gap. Um, and that's, of course, that's, you know, and in that time, mm. as we know, or as I think it's very largely assumed by 99% of the population, someone slid open the patio door and, and snatched and took Maddie away. Right, yeah. So when when you um, got called over to, uh, to to cover this story, John, um, did you think it was going to last 14 years? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I absolutely did not think it was going to last 14 years. I really was surprised that it even lasted four days. Uh, right. You know, I there was a sense that very quickly that uh, you know she was going to be found the body would be found something very clear would come up mm. and like any of these sort of missing stories missing child stories you know normally they last for a few days and then it move on to the next next news but right. something about the family something about the McCanns they were very uh, organised and they really ins they were so insistent on keeping this in the public eye and somehow it struck a chord. It had obviously what hadn't been a very big news week, perhaps hadn't been any major stories, and, and, mm. and the press just latched onto it. They, I think everybody, the whole middle class England, just thought, "My God, it could have been us." You know, everybody knew Mark Warner. It wasn't like they were winging it. You know, just taking their chances. They booked an expensive holiday, a tennis holiday. You know, right. in May, sort of spring holiday, and a group of seven friends, three families or four families, and. Uh, you know, everybody just identified with them. They right. just identified with the horror of, you know, the fifth or sixth night of the holiday, discovering that your toddler's been snatched. Sure. It's gone. Sure. Uh, you know, and it, she's a pretty girl, blue eyes, and, you know, they're doctors. You just don't imagine professionals, whether they're doctors or dentists or journalists or teachers. You, you, you know, you think, you just assume, well, you know, that. They, it's not going to happen to them but of course it happens to everybody this sort of thing right. and we mustn't forget that you know there are missing children everywhere and you know I know Kate McCann's the same she made it very clear in her book that there were so many other missing children and she sort of wonders why you know her case got blown out you know mm. into all proportions out of all proportions really um, but it did and it, it was huge news uh, Bill and I think by a hundred days in there'd been something like 30 or 40 front covers right. in all the newspapers, you know, um, you know, remarkable how big the story was. And, you know, I, I went backwards and forwards for the first three or four weeks, quite a number of times. I was able to drive home for a weekend. I actually had my, uh, my daughter's birthday, uh, her second birthday, which I went right. back for, which was a bit poignant, uh, sure. the, uh, the weekend afterwards, uh, mm -hmm. on the Monday. Um, and it's, you know, and then I came back as soon as I could and, and, and worked again for, 
for the Sunday Mirror, in fact, uh, to, to defend Mount Moore for the Mail. Um, I kind of kept a very close eye on the story, Bill, and, and you know the Olive Press always did as well because, you know, the Algarve isn't exactly obviously isn't Spain, but it you know it's an extension of the Costas. It's you know, not it's very far away, of, really. The fact you could drive to it, John, is it? Yeah, you, and not just that, Bill. It's a there's a physical sort of connection, and also there's sure. the people. There's so many of the people who live there are expats, so similar demographics. Right. Um, you know, so many businesses here actually in Spain, expat businesses are also there and they have an office here that caters for, you know, both sides of the border. Right. Um, and I think, you know, there's also, it became so apparent so quickly that the likelihood of her being brought across the border straight away was pretty high. And, right. you, you know, the border wasn't shut for like 24 hours. So. Right. You know, and I say shut, it wasn't shut, but it didn't, they, they didn't really mo start monitoring anyone monitoring, coming in and out for 24 yeah. hours. But you might say, that, you know, the shutting the stable door and horses bolting, etc., is is the right phrase. And, um, you know, Jerry said he was pretty certain that she'd been taken across the border. And so mm -hmm. we, we, we found, and again, in my book, it's, it, it, we lay out a lot of this, the, the amount of information coming back to us uh, about, oh, you know, Maddie may be here, we think this person's there. There's this dangerous paedophile who lives here, who was camping there. There was, you know, we think there was a child seen here. There's a family at this campsite. And so we just, honestly, Bill, we probed so many stories and my journalists were, you know, were out and about. And some of the time we really thought we'd cracked the case. You know, a couple of times we thought we've got, we've got it. This must be it. I remember this right. campsite in Mikas, in just up the road from, from you there in Calahonda, where mm -hmm. a family of Germans we found out had checked in three days after Maddie went missing. And they checked in with two children in advance. But when they arrived, they had three children. Right. And so the last minute they, you know, they, they checked in. They were German. And this other girl was a small girl of about three or four years old, blonde, blue mm. eyes. Yeah. You know, so that was just amazing. We kind of we really thought this this must be it. You know, it's this perfect timing. Could she have been snatched by this family? Obviously, it turned out not to be true, but so you know we you just go through the motions you check everything mm -hmm. and um do your best to to try and work out could this be true or not who's who was around um so so got to really immerse in the case you just ended sure. up really you know studying it in depth and getting to know know all the parameters in it you, you you said right at the beginning john that you you didn't really get anything any feedback or any uh real conversation from the local police in portugal did did that continue or did did you find that over time you know that there was this kind of sharing of information it, well you know the funny thing is it, it, it a bit like spain they really don't like to help the journalists they don't really right. want to it's got better here but it's still not 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 like it is in the uk or germany um the, the Portuguese had never ever done any appeals for missing children up to this point and, and when right. they were allowed the family to do an appeal on that first night it was unprecedented in Portuguese history and I should point out that actually um, the um, um, the police just aren't duty bound or required to to com comment on, on on crimes and they're not they're not used to it so when they then did press conferences over the next few days, it was they didn't really know how to handle it and what to do. And and of course, the UK press and, and I'd argue that uh, other world media that came in mm. would um, also of um, would also have um, want expect the police to be more helpful, particularly given it was a global news story and it was making national headlines both on television and newspapers. Right. So <clears throat> that was that was strange, and, and you know, and I think that. The, the actual inquiry themselves, the, the PJ inquiry down there at the time was a bit all over the place and they weren't, they didn't do a very good job, which I think is fairly established now because they took Amaral, the then detective off the, off the case, right. brought someone else in and, you know, there was some excuses given to help him a bit, but you know, the truth is, is that it, it was a shambles really. Right. John, we're going to take a very short break for um, a couple of ads and a drop from Dave, and we'll be back to um, pick up on what happened after all of this, okay? Great, no problem. Welcome back, I'm Bill Anderson. Um, I'm coming live from the Costa del Sol, and my guest today is John Clark. Um, 
we've talked about um, some of John's um, background in journalism. He's also <coughs> the owner of the Olive um, the Olive Press Press Media Group. But what we're really talking about today is a book which he has just published, which is called My Search for Madeline. And it is about the disappearance of Madeline McCann. I think wherever you are in the world, um, this this story must have reached you around 2007. Um, it, it was it was a huge story, John, wasn't it? It was it was massive. And um... I don't think that I've worked on any other stories as the only other one. I mean, the other stories that, that I worked on Lady Diana, obviously her death was a big story, but I didn't get so closely linked into that. Luckily, mm -hmm. um, I did bits and bobs for the mail where I, where I worked at the time. Um, but, and I also did a bit on Prince Andrew and, and Epstein because that was something that when I worked the mail on Sunday, we, um, we covered quite a lot. When, when, when's, a when's, a book, when's a book coming out on that one, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd love to do something like that. It, but the problem with it is it, it's the access. It's so difficult because yeah. there's so much of it involves flying around islands that you do need incredibly good connections. Right. So, so much of it's done behind the scenes in amazing uh, locations. So that, that would be pretty difficult, I think, to do a book on. And there are other people better qualified than me on, on that case because I yeah. think, you know, I, I, I did a lot in 99, 2000, 2001, yeah. but then I've kind of sort of left it really. Yeah. Um, but no, Maddie was something that was very different because it's so close to us here, and because we, you know, I, I was called so many times to, can you get back and do this in in Portugal? Could you pop back and do this? Could you go back and do that? Um, so I quite often, you know, I, I worked on it for for the British national newspapers, and I kept some good contacts, developed some good contacts in Portugal and in fact in Spain. Um, around the, around the case, and um, so I think I think it just <clears throat> it was one of those stories that never went away. And, and, yeah. and every year the anniversary of her death came, and the stories came up again. And there was constant. I mean, obviously, as you know, Operation Grange eventually set up, and money was invested. I mean, it was the, the government, British government, even got involved in the case and right. gave money. And you know, if you probably remember Gordon Brown stepping in to help you know sure sure it, it, so it, it kind of got so big that it became a kind of almost um cause celeb mm -hmm. you know people were donating millions yeah. there was a number of very wealthy people donated millions of different agency detective agencies to try and pursue leads um and look into what could have happened and you know the great and the good have been there Mm -hmm. And there've been a fair amount of trolls, Bill, as you probably know as well, who've yeah, uh, sure. been down and claimed this and that. A few of them even based here in in, in Andalusia. Mm -hmm. Certain people who, who who know exactly who they are, yeah. uh, you know, have spent their time going down and, tr and convinced that the family murdered their daughter, and then they're trying to fit the narrative that. So, J John, um, you know, you, you've you've been in journalism for a lot of years, haven't you? Um, this is your career this has been your life what was it about this story that either wouldn't let you go or that you wouldn't let go what was it about this that really captured you no i think it was it, i think it was it was me wouldn't let it go because i think it struck such a chord with me having such young kids at the time right and seeing them growing up and just having this being so close and having a sense that you know what had happened and what could have happened and and just you know really you know you stuck you just want to solve the case and i you know i know other people have spent much longer than me on it and looked into it in more depth but i i have met a lot of the key characters around it and um so when the you know when it when it sort of broke again recently i kind of just knew instinctively that i had to go and, and i had to go and probe it and uh, you know i'm when I mentioned it to the Mail on Sunday, where I still did quite a lot of work, the, the news editor straight away said, "Look, you know, obviously, get, you know, go. Let's just get you up there." It was during the lockdown, the COVID lockdown, so it was very mm -hmm. difficult to get over there. It's actually almost impossible because the border was shut. Border was closed, but we had yeah. to get letters from the UK, from the Mail. We had to have special letters from here in Spain to allow us to go into Portugal. But we did, and it it became very apparent that that this guy really fitted the bill this christian b um mm. and it was just so 
you know, I think I just thought this this is this is it finally. You know, mm-hmm. they finally worked out who did this. Now whether they can prove it is another matter, but this just the the, the information and the, the 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 facts on the ground are just so so fascinating. And mm-hmm. I just I kind of went and I took Lawrence Dollymore, who was my news editor at the time, and he. he he was acting as my cameraman and we went and we just knocked on every single door we could and we just we were like we were like you know news hounds literally we were following every lead sniffing it out and bashing down doors bill and all the kind of thoughts i had at the time that is there a connection here with this sort of new new age hippie community in Barao de saint jean which is about five or six miles inland from prada luge right where there's a lot of drugs and a lot of drifters, a lot of, and I just had this sense that there was some connection, and lo and behold, there was, and it turned out to be connected to Orchiva in Granada in Spain, and so that was, you know, I just had a sense that there was something mm-hmm. going on here, and there was a lot of dr- movement of drugs connected to drugs, and um, so I had, and I got to speak to, I think, for the book, I think I've spoken to six or seven friends of Brookness and flatmates and housemates right. uh, you know have given me unprecedented access to what he was like as a person mm-hmm. uh, people who visited him in prison people who was in prison with who shared a cell with him and also people who visited him in prison um, and to what, kind of give me an up- what was he in prison for John what, what kind of offences are we talking about here well so in Germany he's had 17 convictions I think 19 convictions now because there have been two more recent ones and he started off very early on from a very young age 13 14 a um, lot of sort of vandalism and theft but unfortunately the abuse of children um, mm-hmm. from a very young age nine and six year old children in particular he got a warning slap on the wrist and then eventually he was he was given a suspended sentence um, and you just trace it through and everywhere you know he went there were problems involving children right. and you know he, he he kind of developed a very sad um passion for for i mean he was probably i can't say i don't know how much i can say but mm. i suspect he had a very difficult he had a definitely had a very difficult upbringing that's for sure right. uh he was adopted his, his mother didn't want him he became an orphan um brought up in a christian church uh you know a charity and he he just ended up wrong side of the tracks misbehaving right. his parents couldn't deal with him they by all accounts his adoptive parents didn't look after him very well um in fact i discovered he he was kept in the cellar at some point he was locked in his room without water mm-hmm. uh they were beaten quite a lot him and his brothers um so you know it was just ripe for for um for problems and you know then he became a drug dealer he had drug prosecutions um but I think through the way, right the way through, Bill, when you study his his crime career, it's it's the child abuse that that comes to mind. Right. And then, of course, the most amazing case in Portugal, where the poor woman, a seventy two year old woman, who is a wonderful woman actually, who was a Stanford graduate, who then became did um, English and journalism at university at Stanford in San Francisco, who then moved on became a very successful journalist married a rocket scientist traveled mm-hmm. the world ended up in Prada Luge and at 72 years old was um, unfortunately abused sexually abused by Brooklyn late at night tied up and oh. um, she had uh, she, the, 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 it was films basically and this is what this is what this Brooklyn does because right. it, it, a number of cases where it seems like he films these and from his uh, flatmate i spoke to he sells a lot of this stuff online on the dark web i mean it's it's it's, it's horrible stuff i mean it, it, i've documented it as best i can in the book bill right uh, it's not nice to talk about in some ways i don't know what your listening public are no, uh, what I, they're, they're, you know what i can and can't talk about but it i can tell you it's deeply unsettling um but he was prosecuted found guilty of this this heinous crime in prada luge which happened to be in the same village that maddie went missing and right um it happened two years before and they found a hair in the this poor woman's house in on her bed one of his hairs of course the portuguese police didn't crack the case but fortunately for us the german police have right. and you may know that one month before maddie went missing another girl a 10 year old on the beach was also um assaulted by 
a blonde haired man who spoke in uh, English and then German and then fled up the uh, right. coast towards a, a car park where there were a lot of, sort of German New Age travellers parked up. Mm -hmm. This was one month before Maddie went missing, and the case didn't even get looked at by the Portuguese police. But the police, I'm, I'm pleased to say, the German police are pursuing this amongst five, in fact, six at least, other cases of sex assaults. Right. So I think, I think that there'll be, I think there'll be quite a lot of stuff coming his way anytime soon. So th this guy Bruckner, th do do we know what he was doing in Portugal, or was he just um, a predator out? looking for no good he, he was drifting around bill he, right. he was drifting around and he'd been there a long long time from 99 in fact he first of all turned up in the early 90s or late, late 80s when he was on, just after his 18th birthday he got right. his got his driving license took off and came down to live in the algarve and that's because he was about to be convicted in germany of, of a sex assault right so he, he fled and had to be uh, had to have an arrest warrant out for him. International uh, Europol arrest warrant dragged him back. But he he drifted around in in the Algarve and he worked in bars. He picked up golf balls. He he did a, he actually worked at a, a local newspaper, believe it or not. I think in sales, <laughs> right. strangely. Um, and he did a, a whole series of jobs. But you know, everywhere he went, there was trouble. I mean. All his, I spoke to a number of girlfriends who spoke out. Uh, I talked about how aggressive he was and violent he was. And, you know, he had this house, Bill, that was about 900 metres outside Pradaluge and overlooked the village. And he, ha he could see a bird's eye view of the whole place and knew it like the back of his hand and knew all the tracks coming in and out of the village. And, uh, he, you know, he was the perfect person, you know, yeah. to have been linked into the, the crime of Maddie's the snatch of Maddie and of course now we know that his phone number was used uh, a couple of hours before the crime before she went missing outside the ocean club we know it's his phone number we don't know who he spoke to the, right. the police appeal for the phone number he spoke to and no one's come forward Christian himself hasn't actually um, come forward and explain where he was and what he was doing at the time um, and the police have so much uh, uh, um, evidence that may not be or may not be DNA or potentially could be video or phone evidence. We're not they haven't, mm -hmm. they, they, you know, they haven't told us everything we need to know about this. They have plenty of things they tell me that they haven't released yet. Right. Uh, and they're just continuing to, to probe the case. Do, do you think that there was, you know, we're talking about 14 years on now, John. Um, do you think that there was physical evidence there that may have been missed or may have been overlooked that could have helped in this whole process? Or, um, you know, I, I don't know, do you think it was badly handled? I'm afraid to say during the course of the night from when Maddie went missing to the next morning, I understand that up to 30 people went through the apartments um, wow. wandering about the apartments then sniffer dogs came in that weren't properly checked so I, I believe in the case of Di Diana Menkes actually who's who's the, now died actually the, the victim they found the hair in the bed and it was just a miracle that they managed to have kept it because normally they don't keep evidence in Portugal for the longer than I think it's five years right. they, by amazing fortune they'd kept this evidence from the, this crime in 2005 mm -hmm. it was kind of a mistake actually but luckily mm -hmm. the German police were able to get it in terms of Maddie there's a huge stack of evidence that they've kept uh, which has will have some DNA which will have um, you know physical evidence potentially clothes footprints all sorts of things that we that we a lot of it's been published in the PJ files but I'm convinced the PJ files aren't and they're certainly not intact there's right. a lot of the so-called PJ files which are officially released in English online that are incomplete that are redacted and so I think the, the German police and the Operation Grange I think their battle has always been to get try and get a, a sense of what they can and what they haven't got you know the problem mm. is once a crime scene's been tampered with or has been uh Despoiled, it's you can't go back, can you? You can't. No, that, 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 was, that was really what I was asking, John. That you know, you, you really get one shot at this, don't they? And that's within within the first few hours. Um, once you once you move beyond that, as you say, lots of people coming in and out the the the, the, the rooms, and um, 
you know, so much must depend on, in, in terms of evidence, on, on some kind of DNA. Otherwise, all we've got are circumstances and hearsay and, and whatever. Well, it's been, it, it's, it wouldn't be the first time they've convicted people without DNA. It's certainly happened a number of times you have the right evidence. They, they, the police say they have fo either photographic or um, telephone evidence that put, further puts him there. And of course, if there's enough friends that he might have confessed to, there's enough people that, uh, right. you know, he has to come up with a solid alibi, of course, to explain where he was at the time and why he was, you know, not there. And, you know, they might, they, they, obviously one would be delighted to get some DNA evidence, but th this is, it's a fact that when he went into this woman, Diana Menkes's house, and right. when he went into, uh, allegedly he's accused of, of, a, of another rape of an Irish girl called Hazel Behan up the road, he covered his feet with, uh, with cloths, he carefully had gloves on. This guy is very, whoever it is, is a very, very clever person who's able to cover his tracks and knows what you need to do mm -hmm. to, um, to, 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 to avoid giving any DNA evidence, regularly changing condoms, these sort of things. It's, it, it's, it's a mark of a very dangerous person yeah. uh, that could do these crimes. Now, you know, it's the, up to the Germans. They've said this guy is the prime suspect. They've said that this is a murder inquiry. They said that they've released evidence, uh, picture evidence. Have you seen these cars? Do you know where he was? Uh, they've been getting, they told me they have had, a, a, they're still getting one tip a day, it's well right. over a year. Uh, they have a tip a day. They've had thousands of tips coming in from both the UK and Germany since the appeal last year. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, Bill, we have to remember that because this man lived abroad for so many years and moved in and out and drifted in and out, they were actually looking at him in not just the five sort of obvious cases we know about, but probably potentially many more cases. Right. Um, there's, there's at least one case in Belgium. Let's face it, he drove backwards and forwards through from Germany to Portugal on dozens of occasions. Mm -hmm. Where was he driving through? Driving through Spain, driving right. through France. Myriad of possibilities here, right? Yeah. And th there, is, there is a story about a camper van uh, because I, I, I have read extracts from the book. The story of the camper van, the new camper van. What, what, what do you think that was all about? What, what, what's your theory what, there? The John? huge Winnebago. Yeah. Amazing. I've never seen anything like it. Absolutely huge. It cost, he bought it while he was staying at uh, this, this chap's house, uh, who actually, oddly, was prepared to register his Jaguar into his name. I mean, how he hoodwinked this old guy into doing it, I have no idea. And he actually used his, his Wi-Fi in his house in Germany. And he, while he was there, he kind of searched for various things online. The guy didn't really know what he was doing. But he, one of the things he bought was this Winnie Bago. And this bloody great huge thing. He said, you don't want to buy that. That's ridiculous. You know, how are you going to move around? How are you going to get spare parts? And right. you know, it's actually a Tiffin Allegro. So it's not really a Winnie Bago. That, everyone calls it that. It's actually a Tiffin, right. to use a correct uh, correct um uh, name and it turned up and uh, so he he then drove it off to Portugal in fact he came via Spain he came by believe it or not into the you know the Alpajaras and Granada mm -hmm. he yes, came yeah. to the so-called Dragon Festival right I uh, talked to people there and they said they remembered him turning up with this ridiculous American Winnie Baker <laughs> right. and they remember someone remembered he had a young girlfriend and um, you know, others remembered, you know, that he was coming to buy drugs, and but he he then boasted to the father, yeah, of his girlfriend at the time that it was such a he had so many spaces in there that he could hide not just uh, a few kilograms of, of marijuana, but could also hide a small child, and those were his words. And yeah. so, do, do, do yeah, I, I mean. Um... Do, do you reckon that this was bought off drugs money or again the police investigated a break-in of a house where a hundred thousand went missing that he was supposedly seen at you know they investigated him his name came even up into the inquiry but you can guess what happened next <laughs> yeah. somehow the, nothing happened yeah. and uh, they didn't even go and question him right I, you know I think if you read the book and people hopefully will read it they'll follow it through and they'll just see all these possibilities and options and chances that we had to catch this guy yeah 
um, you know. it, it, it must have been very difficult, though, John. You know, you, you, you've been you've been coming back and forward on this for more than a decade. It must have been very difficult to pull all of these pieces of information into something that was coherent. No. Yeah, you're, you're right. It is, and you know, Schengen. And I think that we're talking to some German. I'm talking to a German film uh, documentary at the moment, looking into the case and. They're sort of horrified, you know. They said, "Well, this whole Schengen agreement is just ridiculous that people can travel so freely and move around without being checked." And you know, I agree. There's so much shifting populations on the costas, and mm. um, you know, so many people are drifting in and out. And in Portugal, you'd be amazed when you go in there. It's a bit like Spain was 30 years ago that people just park up by by you know lakes and in woods. <laughs> Right. They just get left, you know, they do what they want, they can stay as long as they want, you know. And but it was a bit like here, if you remember. Yeah. I don't remember around the nineties and it, it was part of the charm, wasn't it? Is it you know, it was part of the charm had the this yeah. this feeling of freedom and, and, and whatever. But you know, what you're describing in this book is the other side of that freedom. Where, you know, it's not like, oh, I can just get in my car and I can just go and I can camp by a lakeside and whatever. It's it's the 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 possibilities for people who are involved in much less savoury activities than that to just move around and, and not be tracked in any way. Exactly. Exploit the loopholes. And, then, you know, not, let's not... These van lifers, 99% of them are fine. You know, they travel around. They're, you know, they're liberals and they're quite left-wing and they just don't want to enter the system. And, you know, they've got faults because they don't pay. They don't get registered and... The truth is, is they're mostly fundamentally okay people, you know. Yeah. There's nothing really wrong with them. No, sort of no. up. But then you do get these oddballs, these 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 mm -hmm. you know, strange guys that just somehow got away with it. And the Germans are just horrified. A lot of Germans I've spoken to are like, "How did we manage to let this guy get away? How was he yeah. able to live so long out of Germany and not in prison? They can't. They just can't believe it." Sure. So, John, our, our time is almost up. Um, the, 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 let me give not, a plug. It? Yeah, it is. Let, let me give a plug for your book. If if you're interested, I mean, I've I've read the extracts from it, and uh, it's a very, I'm going to say a very easy read. And I'm talking about the style in which it's written. It's very conversational. It, it's um the kind of thing I think um will be a page turner. So my search for Madeline, um, the hunt to solve Europe's most harrowing crime by John Clark. It's available on um, uh, Amazon, uh, both in Kindle and in softback. You know, please let me recommend this to you. John, I really appreciate you joining me today. Um, it's, it's really nice to have a chat with you and, and, and we need to catch up again when, when, yeah, but when your feet are back on the ground pleasure. here. Come on, thank you very much for having me, Bill. I really enjoyed it and uh, it's always nice to see your face, even though no one else can see it, I can see yeah, it. Yeah, I've got a great face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> face for radio. Good. John, All right. th thank you so much. Have a great weekend yeah, and every you success too. with your book. Many thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Bill. Cheers, okay. John. And we're going to go out with a nice song from the Beatles. You're listening to Expat Radio, your worldwide friend.